<laughs> Our question is, how has religious music spread over time and is music, is music the religion of the future? Um, so, uh, where me, Will, and Zach, and we're going to talk about this subject, we'll start with how has religious music spread over time. Yes. So, um, to discuss music and religion and the connection between them, uh, we felt that first of all, we need to know what is music and what is religion. Uh, now, these two words are two vast words and to each one of us they're saying something a bit different so I decided to take uh, a definition from the Oxford Dictionary so music by the Oxford Dictionary is an art of sound in time that express ideas and emotions in significant forms through the elements of rhythm melody harmony and color um, religion from the other hand is a particular system of faith and worship a pursuit of interest followed with great devotion so if we're going according to these definitions of what is music and what is religion, to see the connection between the two, first of all, we need to um, take a look of what, how the music affects our minds, how the music affects us as people. And for that, I'm going to call Will um, to talk a bit about that. And after that, we'll go back to music, religious music, and their effects. How does music affect our minds? I've been on multiple websites and I've seen multiple articles speaking about how different genres can affect different parts of our brains. And I chose this one and the links over there. I chose this one because it has a very nice graph that it has a, and it has a nice representation of how specific genres target specific parts of your brain. You could say, like for, for example, reggae fans have high self-esteem, creative, not hardworking, outgoing, gentle, Pop, they have high self-esteem, hardworking, outgoing, but not creative. So this shows me that there's different parts, different genres target different parts of the brain, so which will, will make you change the way you behave. Okay. <clears throat> so there are two main ways humans receive music. There's perceived emotions and felt emotions. Perceived emotions is um, emotions that happen naturally that you aren't really aware of. So. A song might be in a minor key, but the lyrics might be either very plain and basic, or they might be alluding to sadness, but it's not very direct. Felt emotions are where you're being forced an emotion. So the lyrics are sad, the topic is sad, the music is sad, everything about it is sad, you're gonna feel sad. If everything about it is happy, you're gonna feel happy. The artist, you're gonna follow the way the artists Still recording. Keep going. Okay. These are two examples of how music can affect you. Well, there are multiple ways of how music can affect you, but these are just the most simplest forms. Um, music can affect you. Music can affect your cognitive performance, which can affect your behavior, your views, your opinions on religion, and like I said here, music sound rhythm can af can activate different chemicals in your brain. So music does affect you in some way. Now that we know how music has affected us, we can start to look at how religious music has spread out and affected us throughout the years. Uh, religious music, history. Um, we see in uh, the New Testimony, the Old Testimony, and a lot of articles in the subject that there are so much use of music uh, in old time and in biblical times. Uh, I have some quotes. Uh, this is one quote from... Um, from the Bible says that uh, several um, several musical instruments are here for the service of the house of God and the songs of the Lord. Like a lot of using music in praising the Lord. There's also the famous story about David and the harp. He built a harp to um, praise the Lord. Now um, we can see reference to music um, in all different uh, religions. Uh, from Christianity, Hindu, Judaism, Islamic, and a lot of different small cults around the world. And basically, um, every spiritual guide will use music to approach, um, by their own words, to approach God or to approach the Lord. There is a saying that says that we use the music in praying to open the skies and to reach to God. 
Now, um, I'll take an example, um, uh, the church music, which means the Christian music, just uh, to elaborate a bit more about how exactly they're using the music to approach um, the majority of um, the people. Uh, because one of the main uh, goals of Christianity is to make the, the world or the Christian as a global thing. Um, so, um, church music was mainly played on an organ which created the warm feeling. Um, lyrical value was not a priority as harmony was because as we said, uh, music usually touch connect much better with the feelings and the moods than um, the spoken word. So if I'm taking Christianity as an example and I'm taking church music as an example, uh, we can see that there are very specific methods on how composers create the artworks. Um, the music composed in order to approach and create a good feeling for the listener and a warm feeling for the listener that eventually he'll feel like he's coming home to church. Now, um, a very known example is the Amen, which they use uh, a plagal can, uh, can. Okay, a known example is the Amen that is uh, being said at the end of every prayer, um, being sang at the end of every prayer. Uh, the use of the plagal cadence. The plagal cadence. The plagal cadence. Uh, is transitioned from the fourth chord of the scale back to the tonic, back to home. Um, I'll play the example, I have a video here, but I think I'll play the example and I ha I'll have the lovely Zach to come and uh, join me. Okay, now we're gonna uh, do it now, just to, uh, to let you guys listen to, what, to how it sounds like, which you probably all know. Uh, it's a very famous one, so it goes like so. Okay, so Diabolus in Musica, the devil in music, um, was referring to the triton. The triton is an interval, uh, consists of three whole tones, which create a very dissonant and uncomfortable feeling to the listener, according to the church that days. Um, music was, was in, that, in those days, music was an act of uh, praising the Lord, so music should therefore be beautiful and moving. Um, and the augmented fourth, or triton, or the ministry, however you want to call that, um, is one of the most dissonant musical intervals around, as we said, uh, and it was considered unpleasant and ugly by the church. Um, so they claimed like you wouldn't use anything diabolic to praise the Lord, would you? Now, um, what happened with that is eventually church banned Triton from, uh, from use of composers in the church, and they uh, as well said for the vast crowd to not use this, uh, to not use this interval because it means they're rebelling against God. This move obviously created a lot of cons composers that were against church or wanted to rebel in the church to use the Triton in their own melodies, in their own harmonies and their piece of art. Other than that, uh, a lot of young jazz players that wanted to dissociate themselves from the traditional styles of music that time started using this diminished fifth and uh, in their own artworks uh, in the jazz music. And at that point in time, jazz music became the devil's music, according to church. Now, um, so, this quote uh, was written and published by a popular, but this quote was written by a popular American publisher, uh, and it was published in the Ladies' Home Journal in 1921, which, uh, in this quote, he actually uh, referred jazz music to um, uh, practice voodoo. He's saying, uh, he said at some point that uh, the weird chant accompanied by the syncopated rhythm of the voodoo invokers has also been employed by other barbaric people to stimulate brutality and sensuality. Um, in these days, obviously, nobody compares jazz music to voodoo practice, but back then, it considered the Satan work. So traditional religious music 
It still exists and is still being practiced through hymns in the church of today. Um, however, religious music has also evolved alongside the music industry, mainly representing uh, Christianity. Uh, a big example of this would be through the Jesus movement of the 1970s. Uh, this is when Christian rock was created. The artist Larry Norman, who I've got here, is said to be one of the pioneers of Christian rock, where he successfully merge, merges Christianity and the rock genre together. His first solo album, Upon This Rock, became successful through selling copies in, books, in Christian bookstores, which led him to uh, opportunities to perform at uh, Christian festivals and that had large audiences. He was able to reach out and preach to his audiences in between, uh, in between his songs, which shows us that uh, this new genre connected Christian followers uh, to their faith in a completely new way that was unheard of at the time, but appreciated. Larry Norman said, um, and a quote, is that the primary emphasis is not to entertain, but if your art is boring, people will reject your message as well as your art. This shows us that the, the main purpose of his music was to, uh, was to share and preach the words of God. You can also tell that his main focus was to uh, have an impact and preach to his niche of uh, religious listeners and that he didn't have much interest in the commercial world because in, um, in uh, 1974, uh, he founded Solid, Solid Rock Records to produce records for other Christian artists who, um, and I've got another quote, didn't want to uh, be consumed by the business of making vinyl pancakes, but who wanted to make something non-commercial to the world. This also shows us that people that attended the festivals and performances must have really connected to Norman's lyrics and music, uh, since he wasn't necessarily the most popular musician at the time, he, he still isn't, um, and he was competing with you know, John, Legend, John Lennon's Imagine, for example, uh, which you know, promoted peace and love, but was quite, was, wasn't promoting religion. Uh, cool. Get to the next one. So, um, although Christian rock is not part of the commercial music scene we see today, it, it did introduce other branches off of the genre, like Christian metal bands in the 80s. So I've got Striper here and Bloodgood, um, and it even introduced um, Christian rap, so Stephen Wiley with his Bible, uh, album Bible Break. These artists fit the needs of their audiences, which would have been uh, religious people that enjoyed contemporary, contemporary uh, genres, but didn't uh, necessarily agree with the blasphemy that was in, uh, in, the, in the genre at the time. So uh, I've got some, so for the next band you've got, so these artists like uh, The Damned with Antipope and Slayer um, with Jesus Saves, these were the, the kinds of songs in, in the rock and metal genres and you know, they didn't fit the niche that the Christian rock did, um, which praised Christianity in a com contemporary fashion. Um, so I've, I'll move on to another, another genre, which, was con which is country. And that has developed over time, and, um, and it talks about uh, religious themes consistently. So many country songs share the artist's way of expressing their belief in God. So the majority, you know, the majority of country artists are uh, religious. So you've got. So um, with these two songs, it shows us that. Country music is a much more popular genre than the current and past state of Christian rock and any of its uh, branches of genres, um, which means that uh, popular country artists uh, can reach more people and in turn introduce more people to the Christian faith. So I'm going to use Dolly Parton as an example. Um, 
And with Dolly Parton, some of her most known songs are arguably Jolene and 9 to 5. Uh, along with, it, it's, you've got a lot more others, you've got a lot of other songs. Uh, but the majority of them are about love and not religion. So, you know, these songs would have helped her reach audiences and gain fans in the first place, which uh, would have meant that these fans would have been interested in listening to Dolly's uh, other, other songs that she had, which would have been songs like Heaven's Just a Prayer Away. And that theme is religion. So, you know, it's gonna give a chance uh, to the religious songs that she has and other country artists have, where um, some of her non-religious fans would have been introduced to the Christian faith. So this leads me on to the present day where we've got you know, hip hop, uh, where huge commercial artists like J. Cole, um, in his songs he, he speaks to and addresses to God in a lot of his lyrics. Uh, and Kanye West, he's got Jesus Walks, he's got a lot of other, other songs that, and references, uh, references uh, Christian faith, showing us that uh, artists are still making music around their religious views, which is continuing to affect their fans as they continue to buy uh, the music and support the artists. Um, allowing me to uh, conclude that the religious topics, so, so this is uh, allowing the conclusion that religious topics in songs still do to this day have an impact on listeners um, yeah which leads us on to the next point which is where uh, popular commercial artists are beginning to be able to create a religious feeling and following towards their fans i'm going to pass that on to ronnie to explain that to you okay so we'll go that uh, we'll go back to the question uh, is music is the new religion you know, if religion is a pursuit of interest followed with great devotion, does the way we grasp music today resemble the way we grasp uh, the way religion was in the past? Now, um, what we want to know is music today is something that we admire towards, or music is only the tool to control our beliefs. Um, I'm going to quote uh, Farouk Radwan, which is an MSc who wrote several articles about the psychological effect of music and songs. He said that uh, on the long term, the messages in the music we listen to are accumulating in our brains, and then they can change our belief about life to the extent that to the extent that they can start to affect the way we function in this way. Um, he also said that music doesn't affect your brain directly, but it affects your beliefs, and then your beliefs affect the way you see the world and how you react to life events. So what um, what we're seeing now that through the years are the artist who is playing us the music, who's giving us their music, became more and more crucial in our lives. And do we uh, fans of their music? Do we fans of their life? Maybe we're more than that. Maybe today we're actually looking at the artist becoming our gods. Let's say religion does disappear and we use um music as a substitute to religion so in this example we'll use beyonce and her belief systems her views her the image she's she has created and the way she uses her voice on the internet or how she, however she uses her voice on stage on shows just however she uses her voice we use those as a substitute to religion and to some fans she is a goddess we do worship some some fans do worship beyonce because of the image she has created for herself as this flawless person that can never do wrong is that similar to god does she become a new god to these people another example i want to use is um chance the rapper he i wrote, I wrote um he uses his musical platform to quote 
speak to god in public he he says this a lot in his songs that he speaks to god he worships god through his songs and it's evident you, you can hear that in his songs because it has a lot of gospel influences and like ronnie said the the four ones and the two five ones that's a jazz chord progression but it does have the the going home feeling to it and chance rapper uses that a lot he uses a lot of gospel chord progressions he even collaborated with a gospel legend kirk, kirk franklin and on his i think it was his last album the coloring book it was just the majority of it was speaking to god and how it was it was sort of a prayer how chance the rapper was using that album but on the other hand i feel like chance the rapper might be kind of disciples of god where they spread the message of god they're not really trying to be god or trying to say trying to take god's place in a sense where he's promoting god so like i said he speaks to god in public so in the bible it says to worship god in public which means to openly be proud of your religion to say who you are say what you believe in so in this case chance rapper kirk franklin could be one of god's messengers and i went i went online to see if there were any articles or discussions about religion disappearing just religion disappearing and there was there were a lot of um i don't want to say negative but there were a lot of yes religion will disappear but but there were a lot of religion will disappear but spirituality won't which to me religion and spirituality are two different things so i, I looked more into that and there was a lot of people saying how religion will disappear because of how the cult this culture our western society is evolving and seeing how music is such a staple in our culture but religion was a staple but now isn't i feel like in the future music will stay around and religion might not but i feel like religion will stay around in music so there will be more chance the rappers speaking about god in public speaking about how he worships god and how he trusts in god and how he he can pray for something and know that he doesn't need it right now but it will come to him he there will be more chance rappers there will be more kirk franklins and there will be more beyonce's that present themselves to be goddesses but there will be chance rappers that promote religion in their music